Uh, welcome back to you all. We had a good lunch. Um, I would like to do two things today, this afternoon. Uh, one is to take a look at some of the ideas about Christ and what I would consider false ideas of Christ that are pretty common in the New Age and uh, some of the basic ideas that we see mentioned in New Age. And then in my, uh, I'd also want to take a look at the Enneagram. All right. Uh, seeing as how I've been talking about Catholic issues first, let me deal with the Enneagram, and then we'll take a look at false gospels, okay? It relates in some ways to the various uses of Carl Jung. What is the Enneagram? That's the first question, all right? It comes from two Greek words, ennea for nine, and gram for drawing, all right? And you start off, and the whole Enneagram is very, very symbolic. So that's helpful to, to know. It starts off with a circle. Oh, Kelly. Oh, girl. All right. So it's, uh, sometimes my circle is a little bit better than that, but uh, not when the board is running away. Um, so the, the Enneagram starts off with a circle. The circle symbolizes the world or the cosmos, the oneness of all being, the wholeness of all being, okay? And that's its first. And the circle also symbolizes, therefore, the number one, because it, and it's a symbol of the one cosmos, the one world. Now, inside this circle is an, are two other drawings. One is a triangle. And interestingly enough, for the Enneagramistas, as I call them, the triangle also symbolizes God. But something that we should notice right away, and I noticed this when I took the Enneagram course. I used to teach the Enneagram, by the way, back in the 70s, mid-70s. Um, what I noticed, what everybody should notice, is that God is inside the cosmos. And God is contained by the universe, isn't he? And this symbolism. Rather than God embracing the universe, the universe being inside God, it's the opposite. That's not accidental. I'm telling you that. Remember what I said before, that there's only one being, and that one being is God. This system is inherently pantheistic, as we'll see in a second. And with these uh, points that touch the circle, there are numbers. The multiples of three. Now, when you divide these numbers into one, if, in other words, you take uh, the number three and divide it into one, symbolized by the large circle, you get a mystical number, don't you? It's point. Three, 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 ad infinitum, correct? If you divide six into one, you get point one six 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 ad infinitum. Point one nine 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 ad infinitum. That these, so they say, aha. And then, of course, since you already had one, they just drop the ones and the one point one six and point one nine ad infinitum, and they just end up with. Uh, point nine, nine ad infinitum, point um, six ad infinitum, and three, point three ad infinitum. So very mystical numbers, they go on to infinity, and they really like that. Now, another uh, bit of the, the drawing, if you add the numbers, And then you connect these numbers. One to four, four to two, two to eight, eight to five, five to seven, seven to one. And that, in, and then you have the Enneagram drawing. All right? That's the symbol of it. But it's also a mystical number. Because besides three, 
What is the other great mystical number? Seven, right? If you take and divide seven into one, the number you get is point one four two eight five seven repeated odd infinitums. You keep on repeating that same sequence into infinity. Point one four two eight five seven repeated again and again and again. With no multiples of three in it. Ooh, really mystical kids. And this is part of the symbolism of the Enneagram. They like to work with those numbers. Now, what is the claim of the Enneagram besides the strong? The Enneagram claims to be a 2,000-year-old personality system of nine personality types that comes from the Sufis. Sufi, should be actually because with the fall should be Sufi, comes from the, the Arabic word for wool, because these were Islamic mystics who wore wool cloaks. And so, um, a Sufi, a Sufi is one who wore this type of woolen garment to identify them as Islamic mystics. And that the claim of the Enneagramistas is that the Sufis invented the Enneagram 2,000 years ago. What is wrong with this picture? What is wrong with that claim inherently? There were no Muslims 2,000 years ago. Islam is from the 7th century, actually, uh, yeah, 7th century and the 7th century beginning of, um, yeah, 7th century. Is the beginning of the 7th century is when uh, Muhammad died. So, 6th century into the 7th. So, Sufism, which is part of Islam, can't be 2,000 years old. And as a matter of fact, Sufism itself is from the 10th century A.D. That's when Sufism started. How could the Sufis invent the Enneagram 1,000 years before the Sufis existed? Unless they were all Shirley MacLaine. Being reincarnated. So that's a, that's right there is an impossibility, isn't it? A second point, as you notice, I, as I was describing the mysticism of the numbers, they depend on dividing one into, excuse me, uh, three into one, six into one, nine into one, and seven into one, right? And they get these decimal points, and those decimal points have a lot to do with the, the numbers symbolism here, right? Here we run into another historical problem. The decimal point was not invented until the 15th century A.D. at the earliest. May, well, maybe 14th century. Some not sure, but probably 15th century A.D. How can a system based on decimal points be invented 1,500 years before the decimal point? On which it's based. Makes no sense, does it? And in fact, the first evidence, I mean, I'm talking concrete evidence for the existence of the Enneagram comes from around 1900, in which a man named Georgi Ilyich Gurdjieff George Ilyich Gurdjieff um, says that he brought the Enneagram to the West. He went to a Sufi monastery in Central Asia run by the Naqshbandi band of Sarmuni Sufis. All right, that's this group of Sufis. And they use the Enneagram. But what is interesting, when you read his biography, his autobiography, called Meetings with Remarkable Men, in which he describes going to this Nakhshbandi band of uh, Sufis. He makes no mention of a personality system. 
He uses the an enneagram of the planets, of the colors, of the notes on the scale, uh, all a variety of things, but nothing of personality types. And I read uh, his books. I read books by his disciples, and they frequently mentioned the enneagram, but never a personality system. This used to fascinate me because I had been told that the Enneagram was kept as a secret. But I was amazed at how well it was kept. And that nobody talked about this personality system until, you know, we got it. Uh, I first took a course in it in um, the spring of 1972. This was when the first course was being offered in Catholic circles. It had been taught the year before in the 70-71 uh, school year, at the Esalen Institute in California, Big Sur. Have you heard of that place, Esalen? Uh, this was a place that got so whacked out. They had, and they had so many suicides among the residential students that had closed the dormitory. They had so many people among their students getting enlightenment, and they, or whatever was happening, because I don't know what was going on. Maybe they attracted people prone to suicide. Maybe they drove to it. Nobody knows for sure. But they had an incredibly high number of suicides that they had to close down their dormitory to settle things down. This is where the first course in the Enneagram was taught in the United States. But actually, the second course actually offered. There was, it was originally taught in Peru. And we had always heard, we, well, we were taught in our course that the Enneagram was kept a secret. But now, certain Sufi masters decided that it was time to reveal the Enneagram to the West because the West was finally uh, evolved enough and ready enough to receive it. So we were taught the Enneagram. And uh, Father Robert Oakes, a Jesuit priest from my province, had taken the Enneagram course at Esalen uh, when it was offered there, and he taught it at our theology school in Chicago. From there, from that course, it has spread all over the world in absolutely amazing fashion. I am, my mind is boggled at how widely it spread around the world. Um, and, and I can name some of the characters who learned it from that course. Uh, there was a, a, especially a Canadian Jesuit named Colin Maloney. Father Colin Maloney taught it up in Canada. And uh, Father um, uh, Tad Dunn learned from him, I understand, as I recall. And he taught it to Don Riso. Uh, Jerry Wagner was in our course. He learned it with us. Uh, Jerry Hare. And a number of other people. What's interesting is how many of these became the Enneagram teachers of so many others. Also what's interesting is every single priest in my province or seminarian who taught the Enneagram has at this point stopped or they have left the Society of Jesus. Not a one of them has stayed in the society or continued teaching it. It's amazing. Amazing. I don't know exactly what that means. I do know that some of them have said that they left the society because they didn't feel the freedom to teach the Enneagram. Now, nobody was stopping them. One guy even had all our, one of our retreat houses completely dedicated to Enneagram workshops. He ran the retreat house so deeply in the red, they had to pull him out. And once they started to give the spiritual exercise to the St. Ignatius of Loyola, they went into the black. But while they were teaching the Enneagram, they went deeply into the red. He was doing this 50 weeks out of the year, teaching the Enneagram. And, and he, he also had a, had a lyric. So, this thing is just spread like wildfire. And I, I was one of the people who taught it. I loved it. I thought it was the best thing since sliced bread and the spiritual exercises. We were taught that this is a system of discerning different aspects of your spirituality. It was used for discernment. Okay? And you can understand your personality better as a result of knowing the Enneagram. What did they mean by that? What is the basis of this? And then what are the, some of the facts 
about the origins of the Enneagram. Because I've done some more, I kept poking around to find out about this Enneagram, and I found out a lot of very interesting material that you won't get in most of the classes, but I'll also tell you this. All of my information about the origin of the Enneagram comes from Enneagram Isis, not from their enemies. This is all their own information, not their opponent's information. And I can, I have footnoted all of this information in my book, Catholics in a New Way. Two chapters just on the Enneagram. So you can, if anybody wants to disagree with me, that's fine. But, you know, they're going to have to, or if they want to, if you use it, they'll have to come up with evidence to contradict my evidence, because I've got now, what this system does, as it is presently used, is it starts off, and this is, again, this is the way it was originally taught. It's being changed right now. Uh, some people are adding some points that never existed. We're not part of this purpose. But the idea of the Enneagram is, you are born in your essence. Now, I don't know what they meant by that, but it's your basic goodness, they would usually say. And you are born in this basic goodness or your essence. That's the Enneagram word. And I'll explain later what the Enneagram is originally meant by that. And when you are two to four years old, you choose an ego type. Because your parents have chosen an ego type, you defend yourself against them. You defend your essence against your parents' egos by choosing an ego defense system of your own. And this is what they mean by original sin. It starts at age three or four. Now, or I hope that your ears are already saying, wait a minute, that doesn't sound right. Because it's not. It's not Catholic doctrine anyway. But this is Enneagram doctrine. Now, the nine types that you choose from, there only are nine types. Everybody in the world fits one of these nine types according to the Enneagram system. Right. You know why I call them that? You've heard of the Sandinistas and the Peronistas? Well, these are the Enneagramistas. They, they say that the core of each of these nine personality types, which are the only nine that exist in the whole world, is one capital sin. And it's going to, what's going to be your problem? What's going to be the problem that they're going to have? If the core of each of these nine types is one capital sin, what will be the problem? What's that? There are only seven capital sins, right? They ran out. So they had to make up two more. True. That's, that's absolutely true. Now, I'm, you know, there's lots of sins, but, um, it's, and it's not a dogma that there are only seven capital sins, but they admit they ran out, so they made up two more. So, the number one, has anger as it, number one has anger as its core sin. And this type is a perfectionist, according to them, who's angry that the world isn't perfect. And we gotta make it perfect. And we're gonna make it perfect no matter what. Uh, that's, that's that type. The number two has a sin of pride. And this type is prideful because they say, we can, I can help you. You need me. That's what their pride is. If you need me and I can help you, you got a broken leg, I'll give you chicken soup. That's one of their basic lines for the number two. That they help with stuff you don't really want. Number four has as its capital sin, uh, envy, I believe. And this type that tends to be artistic and sophisticated and thinks that it's above everybody else. Nobody understands them because they're so sensitive. The number five uh, has as its capital sin greed. As a matter of fact, it's called ego stingy in the early uh, versions of this. Because they want to take everything in, they don't want to give anything back out. They'll take in all sorts of knowledge and they'll systematize, but they'll never share it with anybody. The number seven has as its capital sin gluttony. This type wants to lap up all of life's experiences and enjoy everything possible. And they just love to, to take it all, you know, just eat everything up and just enjoy. Yum, 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 life, life, life. 
Uh, sometimes they describe it as uh, California Buddhism, life as a group. Uh, I used to use one example of a priest I met in Peru. Here we are. This guy is a parish priest with 200,000 people living in his parish. He's driving it's in one of the pit neighborhoods of Lima, Peru. And these houses are shacks and nothing. It's no, no, no paved roads. It's Peru. Lima, Peru is mostly overcast and drizzly. You know, days like today would be a normal day, a nice day in Lima. This that's a terrible, you know, place uh, for climate and all that. It's just very difficult. And if you were poor and were driving around this beat up old Volkswagen, saying, "Isn't life just sort of a bowl of cherries?" <laughs> I look at them. Where do you think you're living? This is terrible here. But you know, that'd be sort of the seven type. They're always happy to look. Everything's just great. They're real positive. The so number eight has as its capital sin. Plus, that these these people want power. They they they. I can do this. I am strong. I am powerful. If you are the Macht haben, uh, that's sort of real, you know, tough Nazi approach. That would be, you know, uh, the Russell eight type. Uh, Beethoven is considered an eight. How does Beethoven express joy? That's joy for Beethoven. That, that is considered a character of an eight. Well, the nine, as, as this sin, indolence. Indolence is the sin for the nine. And that takes care of the seven capital sins, doesn't it? Because the nines don't want to cause any waves, don't cause any problems. Just let everything go, and just you do your thing, I'll do my thing. We just get along, and just and we'll just sort of narcotize each other. And that's okay, you know, no problem. Um, now, again, that's the seven capital sins, and that left the three and the six, right? So for uh, the uh, three, appropriately enough, they they created a capital sin, deceit. These are types of people who live in their. Uh, in their self-image, they live in their role, that, but they don't have a, an inner self. They don't, they lie to themselves about having an inner life. And the sixth has a sin, cowardice. Cowardice would be the last one that they made up. Um, this is the uh, Ku Klux Klan type. America for the Americans, and we want law and order. If we have to kill you and string you up, we're going to have law and order. You know? <laughs> They're the type that would break the law to keep the law, you know. So that would be the they mean by ego cowardice. So these are the types that they have. And they go with, there are much longer descriptions for each one. Also, there are <laughs> somewhat contradictory descriptions. I've got my original notes from the class I had in 72. And I read some of the newer Enneagram books. And I say, boy, these people have really gone a long distance away from what we originally learned about the Enneagram. Now, this system, I think, has a lot of problems. It's, it's touted by many people. They love it. They think that it helps you to understand that there are differences between people. That's why a lot of people like this. You know, we're not all the same type of personality. And that there's a dynamic to each personality structure. And that this is a way to gain insight and to appreciate the differences be, uh, between us. And nowadays, what's emphasized in the Enneagram workshop, it's not just the negative. This is so negative. So they want to emphasize the positive. There are virtues that go with them, too. And we should emphasize those virtues behind each side. So that's what they also are trying to teach at this point. That's not what it was originally about. The idea of the egos is that the ego cannot be trained or retrained. It has to be destroyed. You have to remove the ego entirely. And if that's the goal of the Enneagram workshops, originally, get rid of the ego, get rid of this type, so that you can return back to your essence, that you covered up with this ego. That was the original goal. That's what they meant by being a redeemed one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And a couple other things that they used to teach us, and you still hear about this in some of the workshops, 
is that they would say that each one of these is the face of God turned upside down. In other words, we distort something in God and come with the nine faces of God that we distort into these different ego types that are false notions of God. And that we have to find the real face of God and turn it right back side up again. Now, on the Enneagram, there are also arrows. These arrows point in the, to the direction of least resistance. So that if you follow the direction of the arrows, you get worse. A seven, who's happy-go-lucky, every life is a bowl of cherry type, becomes angry like a one, he gets worse. That's how they get worse. An angry one gets worse by becoming envious, like the number four. The four gets worse by becoming like a two, filled with pride. The prideful two becomes worse by acting like an eight, okay, and so on. So that's how they, they, they also describe it even worse. But you get better by going against the arrows. So a one becomes better by becoming happy-go-lucky and, you know, I'm okay, you're okay, God's okay, we're all okay. You know, instead of happy, perfect. You know, whereas the guy says, I'm okay, you're okay, has to become like the five who's virtuous to say, I am wise. And the person wants to be wise becomes better by going against the arrow and, and um, uh, saying, I am powerful, like the number eight. And the eight gets better by, then instead of trying to say, I'm powerful, by becoming, I can help you. Okay? That, that, they, they follow this, they teach this as a way to improve. At least, again, it depends on who's doing it these days. Uh, but that was the original doctrine. Now, That's sort of what the Enneagram is trying to teach. Let me give you some of my critique. First of all, where did the Enneagram come from? Not the Sufis. That's simply untrue. That is a pure myth. It came from a man in Chile, South America, named Oscar Ichazo. Oscar Ichazo. And also his associate, while I'm over here, is Claudio Naranjo. Claudio Naranjo and Claudio uh, and Oscar Ichazo. Who was Oscar Ichazo? Oscar Ichazo was a man who started doing out-of-the-body experiences when he was six years old. Now, by out-of-the-body experiences, usually they're talking about a form of self-hypnosis in which the person feels like they have left their body. That the soul has gone. Now, if you went over to their body, you'd see that their body was A, warm, and the heart was still beating, and that they didn't die. Um, but they feel that they've left their body, and that they're off in other places through a form of self-hypnosis or other people hypnotizing them. And Ichazo started doing this when he was six years old. That's when he lost his faith. He said, what can these Jesuit priests teach me in this school? They're talking about heaven, hell, and purgatory. I went there and came back. I know more about it than they do. This is at six years old he said this. He experienced migraine headaches when he was six and seven years old. So he started practicing the martial arts, Tai Chi and other martial arts, as a way to overcome his headaches. It got him more and more interested in the mystical and in Oriental mysticism. He eventually started, uh, you know, practice or uh, experimented with uh, hallucinogenic drugs that belonged to the uh, Native um, uh, in, uh, Americans of the Andes, the uh, Catua Indians, and also their types of spiritism and shamanism. And by the time he was 18 or 19, he went to uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina, where he joined up as a servant, basically, to a group of seekers who studied their chief. They were, they were interested in studying the writings of George Grichief. And while they were having a discussion, he was cleaning up the table, he gave a very interesting answer to a problem. And they were, became more and more impressed with how bright he was. They didn't realize he was just he was more than a servant. He had been a seeker like themselves in these spiritual things. So they financed, this, this group 
behind there, sending him to the Orient. And he studied Hinduism and Buddhism and other forms of uh, Oriental religion. And while I'm, I, I'm still having trouble piecing together all the details of his chronology, but at some point while he was in Afghanistan, he was in the trance contacting the ascended masters of the universe. Remember them? We've talked about them with theosophy and how the theosophical tradition was in contact with the ascended masters of the great white brotherhood. He just talked about the ascended masters. He went into a trance with a, a contact in the ascended masters and one of the ascended masters told him to take the Enneagram and put the capital sins on each one of those types. In other words, the origins of this personality system come from spiritism. He was directed by a spirit to invent the Enneagram in the 1960s. And he had to make up the, the other two sins, deceit and cowardice, and put them on the Enneagram. He then gave each one a, a name. Ego resent for the number one. Um, uh, I forget, I can't remember all of them now. Uh, I remember Ego um, Go for number three, uh, and uh, I can't, Ego Cowardice was number six. Um, and it just gave these basic names. Uh, it's been a while since I've even looked at those. And he also had these capital sins, and that's all he had. That was all of the Enneagram he had. Until around 1968 or so, he met up with this man down here, Claudio Naranjo, also originally from Chile, but a psychologist who teaches at the Esalen Institute at Big Sur, California. And Claudio Naranjo had gone back home to Chile. He heard about Oscar Chazo and wanted to meet him. And this is a quote uh, on a, from a tape where Claudio Naranjo is the one who is my source for it a lot of this information about the origin of the Enneagram. He said, at first I was not impressed with Oscar Ichazo, but when I sat and meditated in his presence, I could feel his power, and I accepted him as my guru and teacher. So, at that point, they, they hooked up with each other, and Naranjo liked the Enneagram, and he added... To the Enneagram with these nine, cap nine capital sins and nine names on it, Naranjo is the one who added descriptions of the personality types. He got these descriptions from an American psychologist named Karen Horney. She was uh, writing in the 30s and 40s, I believe. And he used those descriptions from Horney, put them on here, added... Freud's nine defense mechanisms and put those on the Enneagram and began, and the two of them, uh, Naranjo and Ichazo, taught a group of Big Sur uh, 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 students the Enneagram down in Chile, in uh, Arica, Chile, uh, in South America. That would have been probably 1970, 69 or 70. And then the next year, Naranjo taught the Enneagram at Big Sur itself. And that's where Father Bob Oaks took it, Helen Palmer, Kathleen Reardon, and a number of others who began to write about the Enneagram. What's very interesting is that Naranjo claims that all of these people signed a written agreement never to teach the Enneagram. Within months, they were all teaching us, including Father Oaks, who taught us about the Gate. Now, when I took the Enneagram, it was because, you know, Oaks was teaching it at our theology school in Chicago, and it was the hot item. I mean, it was the buzz. Everybody was doing the Enneagram. And all of the, it just dominated conversation at our school of theology. Well, 
Of course you're doing this. You're a two. Well, you fours always say that. No, you fives drive me nuts. You know, this was the way we were talking about each other and to each other. You know, I think he's a nine. Yeah, I, don't know, I think you're right, you know. And people go on and on and on with all these numbers. Nowadays, when people ask, oh, well, what's your number? I always tell them it's unlisted. Now, I believe that this myth, and it is purely a myth that the Enneagram is a 2,000-year-old Sufi invention, is a way to have the Enneagram Easters avoid serious scholarly research. Also, it's a way to avoid the embarrassing fact that there is no research that gives any basis to this Enneagram and its truth. This is one of my first problems, and I want to emphasize that. All of the people who take the Enneagram say, well, it helps me so much. That's what counts. That is an anecdote. That's your personal opinion. How can we get a double-blind study, a series of double-blind studies, to examine whether or not people consistently say that this is helpful to them? Their social scientists could do it. It would take them work. And I would have a number of questions for them to examine. First question. The Enneagram assumes that the core of your personality structure is one capital sin. Why do you think that's true? What evidence do we have that one capital sin is the core of your characterological structure? I'm not bragging about this, but it is a fact. I happen to commit more than one of the capital sins. There are times when I make the rounds. And to limit myself to looking at one capital sin is a mistake. Because it can blind me to seeing the ways I commit the other capital sins. Well, but you're not an eight, a seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. You know, you're not nine. No, you're not. So you don't have to worry about that. You have to worry about your capital sin. No, I have to worry about any sin I commit because it's an offense against God, and I can't neglect looking at my sins, including the other sins from other types. So I, I really have a question about that, and I have a question, obviously, from you know, on a theological level, that you know, you don't just. I mean, I've actually had. People come up to me, it's happened a couple times only, thank goodness. But he was saying to me, in confession, blessing Father, I have sinned, I'm a one on the Enneagram. What? I said, that's not a sin. Tell me what you did. I can't give you a solution for that. You know, that's not, that's, that's not something you confess. It's ridiculous. That wasn't the number that they gave up. But, but still, it's just ridiculous. Ridiculous. You know, you don't confess that. And, and I finally had to sort of pump it out of them. Did you do something wrong? I can, absolutely, I can absolve you of sins, but this I can't. Well, this, this is one of the things I've been careful of. This was nonsense theological. A second scientific question I would ask. How do you know that there are only nine personality types? What evidence do you have that there are only nine? Thirdly, how do you know these are the nine if there are only nine? What evidence? And the only evidence we have is Oscar Ichazo was told while channeling a spirit that there are nine types and that these were the nine. Why should I believe a guy who is channeling a spirit and take that as gospel? It's not the gospel to listen to channel spirits. I want some evidence. And these people don't have a lick of it. That these are the only nine. They teach that as an article of faith in their courses. There are only nine types, and everybody fits. And if you don't think that you fit, you must be an eight because they don't think they fit in with anybody. All right. So you can't, you're trapped by their system. But I say let's examine to see if this is true or not. I suspect it's not. But that's you know that's something that again is my opinion. We want evidence. A third. Uh, so th- that'd be actually the, the three, first three questions. How do you know that the, a capital sin is the core of your personality structure? Two, how do you know there are only nine types? Three, how do you know that these are the nine? Fourth question is, these descriptions and defense mechanisms, how do you know that these are appropriate just for these types? What evidence do we have for that? You know, Karen Horney's personality system isn't used much by psychologists because it's not something they could verify. 
I suspect the same is true here. I think that those types of questions need to be answered on a scientific level. And people need to, to do anything with it. Because if you don't have some scientific evidence for this, and again, I'm not trying to say you have to prove every single thing here, absolutely. You know, I'm not looking for that. I'm looking for some evidence. There's none. It's not been studied independently. And I, my point with that is, not just that I want to be the super rationalistic type of psychological type or anything. No. If you don't have some examination of this and some evidence that it's true, then you have no criteria by which to judge if somebody was teaching true things about it. If you have no evidence, you have no criteria. If you have no criteria for it being true, how would you know whether somebody is an authentic Enneagram teacher or not? How do you know someone who's a hack? from someone who knows what they're doing. If there is a possibility of knowing what you're doing with any which again, I suspect is not the case. I doubt it. I doubt it. I think that the whole thing is going to be, would be shown to be bogus. But, if there were something there, how would you know who is an expert unless you had criteria? There are no boards. There are no tests. There are no examinations. People take, an, they do exactly what Claudio Naranjo did. He and Ichazo invented a course, and after one course, Naranjo started to teach it. And then after Naranjo taught one course, Father Bob Oak started to teach it. After one course in it. I took a course in it, and I began to teach it. And this goes on with almost all the Enneagramistas. They take one course, sometimes too. Sometimes. And then they become an expert. Now, that also indicates that this thing is so simplistic that you can learn the whole system in the course. This is also one of the reasons why I think our retreat house that had become dedicated to the Enneagram had gone, was, was on the way out of business. They were creating their own competition. They taught them everything they knew after one semester or so. Take a couple of retreats, you know all that they have to know. You might as well become your own Enneagram expert, just like that they did after one or two courses. I think that that's just way too superficial. I would call for, if I, if I were the king of the world, I would ask for a complete moratorium on all the Enneagram workshops until they did come up with some sort of scientific evidence for it. That's not going to happen. I guarantee you that. Because people are using this to, in, in retreat houses around the world. And it's become very, very popular. And it's become, I think, sometimes a substitute for spirituality. I also have a lot of theological problems with it. This, to me, is uh, far more serious than the psychological problem. And it depends on who the Enneagram teacher is. Because they don't teach same thing by any means. Some of these people are making it up as they go, but there are a lot of dumb things that are being taught theologically. One I already mentioned, that you choose this ego when you're two or three, and that's original sin. That's not what we mean by original sin. Original sin is something you inherit from our first parents. This is something that belongs to the human race. And there's no noble savage, there's no noble civilized person. Everybody's a sinner. All we like sheep have gone astray and turned everyone to his own way. This is something that's the reality. All fall short of the glory of God. And we share in the sin of Adam, uh, despite what Father Matthew Fox says, when he, did, he says that St. Augustine invented the doctrine of original sin. It wasn't St. Augustine. It was hundreds of years before St. Paul, Romans 5, 12 and following. Uh, and the fathers of the church before Augustine. It's a very important doctrine. And it's not, and the original sin is not something that we are at fault for. It's something, you know, I was talking to a little girl, getting ready for her first confession, I mentioned her yesterday. And, you know, I asked her, you know, do you have to, conf- when you go to confession, do you confess original sin? She thought about it and she said, no, you don't do that. You know, that's sort of a trick question. Of course you don't confess original sin. You didn't commit it. But you get baptized to have it removed. You know, it's not your 
responsibility, you still have to have it removed, right? But through baptism. And the effects of original sin, sin remain with us. We have to still deal with those. Um, but it's not something that we choose at age two, or between two, three, and four. Another problem is what I said before also about the essence. You are born in your essence and you return to your essence after you overcome your ego type. What do they mean by that? Gurdjieff says quite explicitly what they mean by it in his book, Meetings with Remarkable Men. The essence is that within you which is the same as God. In other words, this is a pantheistic system in its root from Sufis, that you have the divine essence within you and that you return back to your divine essence after you get rid of the covering of the ego. That's nonsense. That's very common belief in the New Age movement. As a matter of fact, in uh, Course in Miracles, that's one of the things that would be believed, that you have to get rid of your ego. Ego is what blocks you from your, your, the Christ within you. Well, we don't ha- we're not by nature Christ. We're not by nature God. We're made the children of God by grace and by God, as adopted children of God. Christ is the only begotten Son of God. He is God by nature. We are children of God by adoption. Romans chapter 8 and Galatians chapter 4. But this system assumes that you are God by nature and your ego simply covers that up. It's nonsense. Nonsense. Another problem that flows from that is, according to this system, and, and again, it depends on who teaches it. And you have to pay very careful attention to any teacher. But one of the typical problems is that it's very Pelagian in its theology. In other words, you save yourself. You get rid of your own ego. The role of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross is not present in many Enneagram teachers. And the role of God's forgiveness of your sins is not so relevant. It's more the issue, you get rid of this ego. You destroy it, you remove it, and it's gone. Well, that's saving yourself. That's not Christianity. Christ saves us by dying on the cross and rising from the dead. And his death is done as an expiation, sacrifice for us, where he is both the priest and the victim, because he offers up himself as a sacrifice for our sins. And only he can do that. Only Christ, who is God made man. Christ, who is infinite God and a truly human, is able to offer up the infinite sacrifice that forgives us our sins and reconciles us to God. We can't save ourselves. And that's what the Enneagram uh, assumes that you can do to save yourself. That's not true. And then I've heard uh, and read some things that are absolute nonsense. There's a a book I read on spiritual direction and the Enneagram. My sister Suzanne Zurcher. I was reading through uh, uh, about 45 pages into it. And I noticed something was missing. So I went back and reread. And as I went through the whole book, I realized, uh, because I counted she mentions God seven, maybe eight times in the whole book. Now, this is a book on spiritual direction. And God is only mentioned seven, maybe eight times. To what are you directing people? Was my question. What was even worse, because it was, that was an omission, I think. Well, what I think was, you know, positively a problem, in my opinion, is when she describes one of her clients who says, well, Michael and I started to act out sexually. And I felt guilty about it. I knew that God would never make me feel guilty. So the guilt couldn't come from him. And then I realized, oh, of course, I'm a two on the Enneagram. And I feel guilty because of my mom. And once I realized that, I didn't feel guilty anymore. Well, my dear, 
unless Michael is your husband, you are guilty. And you, and if you are guilty, it's not bad to feel guilty. And it might well be God who helps you to feel guilty for something that you are guilty for. Now this, uh, 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 we have to say at uh, one level, this person was acting uh, and, and assuming that one of the basic doctrines of the Oprah and other talk shows. The word, the last sin that on those talk shows is to make somebody feel bad about themselves. To make them feel guilty. Right? You know, when, I'll never forget uh, hearing about, I didn't see the show myself, I heard about it, when Montel Williams had a woman who had given up her son. She had a child out of wedlock, gave up for adoption as an infant. He went and he found his mom, and they immediately fell madly in lust with each other and started to shack up. As husband and wife, though they're you know, mother and son, as though they're committing incest here, right? And people react like some of you are. So, oh, you know, people say, oh, that's terrible. What was the reaction? How can you make them feel that way? Who are you to judge them for their behavior? And well, you're going to give them a complex. Okay. Maybe that will get them to stop. Incest is not good. If he, if he were to conceive his child. Can you imagine the effects genetically, just on that level, yet alone in terms of you know, the sin of committing incest? And this is um, an effect that's going to have on, on have for this kid. He's 16 years old. He's living in incest with his mom. What's he going to be like when he's 36 and 46? You know, the effects of this are going to be serious. Well, in any rate, the attitude in the talk shows is you can't judge somebody for what they're doing wrong. You know, stop that. That's ridiculous. Well, this, this, this uh, Benedict and Nun was using the Enneagram in the same way. We don't want to talk guilty people out of feeling guilty. We want to have guilty people confess their sins, repent of their sins, and change their lives. That's the goal. I Believe me, I would love it if every potential murderer became so overwhelmed with guilt that they wouldn't commit murder. That would make me very comfortable, and it would make their victims, or potential victims, alive. I'd be happy for potential rapists to feel so guilty about committing rape that they didn't do it. For the sake of their victims, I would be delighted with that. Because I don't want people to do guilty things and then to feel that it's okay. That's not morally right. And when some use the Enneagram to help encourage that, that is completely an abuse. Now, some would say it is an abuse. Some say, oh, see, you're criticizing that only somebody, one person teaches. But we have to call you know, the problems as we see them. And this, to me, is a very serious spiritual problem. And I don't think that, you know, in the long run, the Enneagram is going to do the church good. I think it's, it's going to do it harm. It already has in many ways. And I think that the harm is going to outweigh the good. Now, I get people yelling at me and screaming at me. Literally, literally yelling and screaming. Oh, you should have stand in Australia. Usually those people are so nice. Well, you know, I went after the Enneagram. They just went berserk some of them. You know, how dare you call the Enneagram evil? And I, I remember, I'll never forget that. I was in Perth, Australia. You know, and I looked at the audience and I said, did I call the Enneagram evil? And I didn't do that here either. You know, I didn't say that, I, and, I, I, and I didn't say it to somebody, so you're saying it's demonic, and I never said that. I don't think that it's demonic. Uh, I, I do know it came from spirit, you know, channeling. That is because Don Rizzo, one of the, the probably the number one Enneagramista on the East Coast, you know, wrote that. This is what they write. And Clyde Naranjo confirms the, the other data I'm giving you here. But, you know, what I'm saying is that I know most of the Catholic teachers of the Enneagram have no idea that it came from spirit channeling. They are not trying to teach spirit channeling. They are not trying to encourage spirit channeling in their retreat houses or something that they, they, they don't even think. They think that it really is Sufi. They're honest in that, I, I'm, I'm assuming. But despite the sincerity and their honesty, 
I still think that we need to call this thing into question as, and, and say, examine it scientifically, see if it holds up. And if it did hold up, then you still have the task of making sure you get rid of any theological error that would get people to pervert it. The basis has to be the gospel of Christ and that the gospel of Christ will judge the Enneagram, Freud, Jung, or anybody else. They don't judge Christ or his gospel. Christ is the basis, not these different psychological systems. And I think that quite commonly what's happened in Catholic circles is that the psychological systems have become the basis to judge the gospel. And its authenticity is judged by these systems. And this has also become a way in which other New Age ideas have sometimes gotten in. Okay, why don't we uh, take a uh, little time for question and answers? Some comments? Yes, sir. Well, I want to step up to the microphone. There's a mic here. So people can hear your question. Hello? Yeah. yeah. Um, I won't mention the pastor's name. Good. But, uh, I was... Uh, a couple of years ago, I was talking to my pastor over the telephone, and I told him, yeah, I looked at the church bulletin, because I hadn't gone to church for years. I started going again for various reasons, and uh, looking in the bulletin, there was a notice for Enneagram, and I saw, I think it maybe was one of your shows, that you're um, downplaying uh, the Enneagram, saying that it is, you know, it's bad. So I told the pastor, you know, why is there a workshop in, uh, in, uh, in, our, in our parish? When you know, I, I heard on EWTN that you know this is this is really bad and it's sort of a cult. And it was it was Father Mitch Park when he says, "Well, that's Mitch Park's opinion." And he says, "You know, half that stuff on EWTN, I think, is a lot of you know, it's garbage." Right. And uh, so I'm kind of like right then that kind of like red flag the situation for me. Hmm. And when another woman, maybe a year later. Uh, she approached this pastor. She's trying to get him to stop this Enneagram stuff at the parish and then offered him to, well, you know, Mitch Pacwa has a tape here. We had the, a tape in a library in, an, in a different parish on the Enneagram. He's your tape. And, but he won't listen to the tape either. So he, he's not going to listen to this stuff. So, so what do you think we should do? Well, there are a couple things. Um, this is the, the usual response I get. Well, that's just Mitch Pacwa. And that's his, his opinion. I hear that constantly. They never deal with my data. This is my, I don't care if I, it's my opinion or not. That's ir, my opinion is irrelevant. The data that I have here is what I think is relevant. And can they show me that they're not making up a myth? Can they show me that, you know, what I've said is incorrect? And that they, and also, you know, I, I'm not Again, I'm not saying that this is something that, you know, evil spirits have taken over your parish for this. I'm saying this is psychological nonsense, probably. That's my opinion. But uh, I want to see evidence. Now, uh, and that's one of the things that I would challenge them to do. What evidence do you have, Father, that the Enneagram is true? What studies show that? How did they come across the, the, this information? What, how did they do the study? Who did it? Why? And I would ask people to come up with the evidence. That's what I'm saying about the Enneagram. And also, it depends on what they're teaching. I don't know what the guy's teaching about, uh, you know, the, the theology of grace and salvation in this course. Find out. You know, is this solid Catholicism or not? You know, that's, that's my main issue. And I would hope that, you know, I'm not just, you know, giving you uh, something to be frightened of, but more, this is a way to start approaching the question with these people from, you know, from various perspectives, like psychology and theology. And, and say, you know, don't let them dismiss it because it's me or somebody else. Deal with the data. That's the key. To show me your evidence that this is, you know, that you have to show that these assumptions are true. That's how I deal with it. Okay? Uh, you know, and one other problem, too, and this is one of the things I uh, almost forgot to mention. Because uh, we had a seminarian move in my community when I was up in Chicago.
Chicago, who was really big into the Indian ground. He just loved it. And um, and also Myers Briggs and that stuff. And he, he started to pull the stuff in the house, you know. And, and he'd used this in the previous community to manipulate relationships. Well, of course you say this because you are an I, you know, IJFP or whatever, you know. Uh, and um, that, uh, of course you do this. Uh, oh, and that's it. It's perceive, perceiver and intuitive. That's the other one. I remember when I said IJFP. Um, that, yeah, of course, you're, you're perceiving intuitive or whatever type judgment. Uh, the other way you do this, then you're a nine on the Enneagram. Oh, and, and he used that to control relations. That's another real pro- a major problem that we saw in our seminary, that guys use this to manipulate relationships. I know what you are, and I understand your personality better than you do. Not so. Knowing who I am is a privilege that I offer to those to whom I reveal myself. These people are trying to short-circuit authentic human relationships. By saying, I understand you better than you do. Nonsense. You have to know me. And that's something that's a privilege I'll share with those who are my friends. Or not share. But, you know, that's something that, uh, you know, we de- I decide too in the relationship. And I'm very concerned that people pigeonhole one another. And they'll say to you in the seminar, well, that's not what we're trying to do. But then I guarantee you this. They will use examples of people who never made the Enneagram workshop to illustrate the types. Helen Palmer and all of them do it. Pope John Paul II is the number one on the Enneagram. Mother Teresa is the number two on the Enneagram. Teodish Dan is a seven on the Enneagram. And they go through all these characters who never took an Enneagram workshop. And yet they still think they understand who they are. And by their example, they teach you to manipulate relationships by pigeonholing people. That's why even when I did in my book, instead of using the standard examples they use, I use cartoon characters, which is probably more appropriate. But, that's me being snarky, but the, the examples uh, that they use give, a, you know, provide an example of manipulation. I think that that's a problem. And I would ask, you know, Father, what are you doing in the parish to make sure that the Enneagram doesn't lead to people pigeonholing one another? Now, people may pigeonhole you for being opposed to it. Yeah, it probably is a eight. They hate the Enneagram, you know, or whatever. <laughs> and, and, and one of the reasons I know that I used to do that to people myself. That's what got me out. That was, was what first got me out of the Enneagram. I used to say, but, oh, I think you're a one. You're probably a two. And I would do this, and I was wrong, as was my teacher, wrong again and again. Only he even had some of his opinions written up and he and published with wrong interpretations of people's personalities. And, you know, we all do it in the Enneagram, and that's why I stopped. Sir, you have a question back there? Oh, does this show up in other Christian circles? Not very much. One, and why in Catholics and retreat houses? One of the reasons is, when you look at Protestantism, they don't have much spirituality. Protestants have ecclesiology, structure of the church, Christology, and soteriology. That is, the, the, the study of the theology of salvation and soteriology, the study of Christ. is Christology. Those are where they have their emphases, but they don't come up with many spiritualities. As a matter of fact, many Protestant traditions are afraid of spirituality, whereas Catholicism has a wide variety of spiritualities. There's Franciscan spirituality, there's the Ignatian exercise, there's Carmelite spirituality, and it goes on with lots of others as well. Just lots of different types of spirituality. Eastern Rite and, and Western Rite. Correct? And so this appeals to Catholics who already were predisposed to have spirituality. And it's portrayed as a way of, of doing spirituality. So that's why it spreads so quickly. Okay? And people from Australia, oh, my word, it's just unbelievable down there. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Okay, as a matter of fact, if you go to music stores, you know, to, to buy music, you'll oftentimes see a section called New Age. All right? And they sell New Age music. Now, 
85% of what's called New Age music is simply like jazz. All right? 85% of it. You've got George Winston, I think, and a few of them. A bunch of these people, uh, Mannheim Steamroller, maybe. You know, they're put in a New Age bracket. But that, I, I talked to some friends of mine in the music industry when I was in Nashville, Tennessee. That is simply an economic bracket that they have, and 85% has nothing to do with the music, uh, with the movement of the New Age. It's just light jazz. I don't like it, you know, because I still like country western. All right, I like George Strait. All my exes live in Texas. Their father's died in Tennessee. Well, that, I love it, but that's a, that's a personal taste. But there is 15% of that music, approximately, that is hardcore New Age movement. And you can recognize some of that for with uh, a few few elements. First of all, some of the music that's hardcore new age will have subliminal messages in it. They'll be saying things that you can't hear audibly but on the soundtrack at an inaudible level, and they say that you'd be able to pick it up with your higher self and all this kind of thing. Now, if if these are made in the United States, it's against the law to not publish that there is a hidden message. All right, that's 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 U.S. law. You have to publish that, so you can see if that's in there. Okay, and they have to say that in the record. Secondly, you also see um, that sometimes the uh, so Steve Halpern, for instance, uh, he has music to activate your chakras. In other words, he's telling you, you know, you know what chakras are? They're the seven centers of consciousness. That's one, the first one at the base of your spine, another one right below your navel and your sternum, your heart and your throat, your, your third eye in the middle of your forehead, and there's the last chakra right above your head. These are centers of consciousness where, according to Kundalini Yoga, you have uh, the ethereal body meeting the physical body. All right? And he'll say that my music is there to activate your chakras one at a time. So meditate on my music and you activate your chakras. He's, he's telling you that he's New Age. All right? Sometimes you'll also see New Age Wicca music, you know, where they are doing uh, witch music. You know, you see drum beats and other things like that, or shamanistic music, and they'll say so. Those would be some of the things that you'd look for for the hardcore New Age music. Now, most rock and roll music is not New Age. All right? Some of that is satanic, as by their own admission, you know, there's satanic, uh, they, they, they'd be Satanists. See, new rock and roll tends to be, I mean, especially, you know, heavy metal, but that's, that's just way too um, strong for most New Agers. They want something more mellow. And New Age music tends to be pretty mellow. Uh, whale music, they like the whales and the dolphins. No, that's not that sort of part. But uh, that's, you know, some of the, the music stuff. Okay? Is that? Yeah, yeah. Some, some of them, there's a, a, a nice little video, but actually it's a lot big video called uh, Hell's Bells. Have you seen that? Okay, well this is this is not fine. This is a, a movie or a video put out by a group of Christians. And what they're saying that the bells of hell are, uh, comes from heavy rock metal music. And that they document how the heavy rock musicians um, use blasphemy and satanic worship, and sometimes backward messages, things like that, in their stuff. And they get, they document it very, very well. It's about a five-hour video. And if you want to get a good idea of this stuff, uh, some of it was so bad, they had to censor it out. Because it so, there, there, some of it is such explicit sex uh, and such explicit blasphemy, they had to take some of it out. Yeah. Yeah, same thing. Yeah, that would be more, you know, see, rap is something a little bit different, too. Uh, rarely do they mention Satan or, or, you know, it's just really angry, angry people and saying violent, nasty things. I mean, uh, I mean, why would a, a woman ever put up with a man saying those things to her? She just slapped his face and, and walk away. And, and the, the rudeness, and the meanness towards women in rap music is horrendous. You know, calling women names and things like that. 
And that's how, and that's why I like George Strait. He knows how to talk to a lady. You know? <laughs> and the rest of the country western music too, for the most part. Yes. Okay, the, the question is, is the Enneagram a form of, uh, determinism? Not, they wouldn't see it that way because unlike the, uh, horoscope, they're not predicting your future. They're just saying this is the way you are, you're described that way. And that you chose your personality type. Um, so I don't think that that's it. And they also say that you have free will. This is just your, you know, your emotional reactions and your, uh, you know, your, the patterns of your emotional reactions. So it's not that you're predetermined to do this stuff. Um, I, st whether, uh, even still I have a lot of problems with the description, but it's no more, uh, deterministic than, you know, say the, the four temperaments were, you know, in the old spirituality. Is the Enneagram found in the RCIA? I've never heard of it being used in RCIA, but I wouldn't be surprised. It wouldn't surprise me one bit. I'm, I'm not surprised to find it anywhere. I mean, it's being used in seminaries. You know, to, uh, before a guy gets into the seminary, before, in some religious uh, orders of women, before they get into the convent, they have to do the Enneagram and find out what they're like. Well, that's silly. That's a stupid stick. Um, you know, what does that got to do with anything? Um, but that's sometimes what you see or not. Oh, it's en Enya, Enya. Um, I don't know. I, is she on the country station? No. I don't know. I don't know who she is. <laughs> I don't listen to their music much. I just, it just drives me so bored. You know, but they, and they don't listen to much country western. They're, they're tired of pick up trucks. <laughs> And bar room. Actually, I haven't been listening to much country. But they've gone down in quality. That's not as good as it was about five years ago. I haven't noticed it. They need to get a little more country. They got two rock and roll. Uh, gone. I like country music. That's that's fun stuff. <laughs> I just think of some of the country western songs. Right? Is, yeah. Anyway, go ahead. A nice way to describe mass mental nature? Well, I don't know. Um, they're not a very nice story to me. I mean, these people are just driven out of paradise. Um, that's not very nice. Um, one of the things I would do, take a look at the catechism. Start off there. What do we see about original sin there? And, and if nothing else, does your pastor believe in original sin? You know, that, that, that'd be very key. Um, one of the other things, too, I, I would say is pick your battles carefully. Sometimes you may not, it may not be worth winning that battle because there's a bigger one that's more. For instance, I had a discussion with a high school girl who said, I'm not sure I accept that the Catholic Church teaches about certain things, and I'm not sure I want to be a Catholic anymore. Well, what things, my dear? And it says, well, you know, uh, and I said, things like birth control? She said, yeah, right, but I'm, I want to use birth control. I am using it. I will use it. And I said, abortion? Well, exactly. I mean, a woman has a right to have an abortion. I mean, if you don't kind of raise that baby, right, you should abort that baby. And I said, and premarital sex? I said, yeah, exactly, because my boy, well, that's why you're using birth control, right? And, you know, so this, uh, and I was discussing this with her, and I said, you know, First of all, uh, you have to deal with a more basic question. Because the birth control and the abortion follow from you're not willing, because you're trying to deal with the effects, uh, and you're not willing to give up you know, fornication. And you don't trust that God has given you a law. You're trying to, she's trying to say, the church has this law on uh, birth control and abortion and premarital sex, and I don't think I agree with the church on that. I said, it's not the church you're disagreeing with. The top ten hit parade of God's favorite commandments includes adultery, and of course, fornication. And if I'm not the one, it's not that the Pope who came up with the idea that in, no fornicator can enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's in the scriptures. That's Revelation, chapter 21 and 22. 
1 Corinthians 6, 11. And that is a Christ in the Sermon on the Mount. All these people like to tout the Sermon Well, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. That's the Jesus I love. That's the Jesus who said, if you even look at a woman with lust, you're liable to the hellfires of Gehenna. Well, that's not Jesus meek and mild. That's him telling as it is. And your biggest problem is you don't trust that God is, is dealing with you. In other words, the reason I mention the story is sometimes you deal with, if you just argue, if I just were to argue with her about birth control, we'd get nowhere because that wasn't the real issue. The real issue is she wanted to commit fornication and have protection against having a baby or if she has one, to be able to feel permission to kill her. That was the bottom line issue. And you have to go, and the bottom line behind that is, she doesn't trust that God is the one who's saying this. And that it's his issue. And she left the discussion really fairly satisfied. She said, you know, I never thought of that. You know, and, and, and I said, look, you need to talk to our Lord. You need to pray about this. And I, and I used the example from my own life that my father told me not to play with matches because I was going to burn myself with a house down. God is telling you not to commit fornication because if you do, you will have your heart broken by that boy. You are a fool to believe what that scoundrel is telling you. That's my basic analysis of a lot of the young women and men. The women are fools and the men are scoundrels. The women are fools for believing those scoundrels. And this is the reality. And I said, you're just going to break the heart. And God doesn't want your heart broken. Like my daddy didn't want me to burn myself. And you, he also, if you commit fornication, you are going to harden your heart. You are already doing it. You're already willing, saying that you would be willing to kill your baby. And that in an abortion, you'd be willing to have somebody go in there and cut off the arms and legs of a little baby and squeeze its head to break it. And then sweep it out. That's what they do with an abortion. And you would be willing to have your heart so hardened as to cut off the arms and the legs of a baby and crush its skull. And she says, you know, she's never thought of that. And you have to sometimes go behind all the questions. If you fight just, you know, the Adam and Eve thing, you're probably going to miss the big battle. That's a skirmish. And when you get the other question, you know, can you trust God? Like with this girl. Can you trust God to give you laws that are sensible to live and wise that God's laws will make you a better person? You'll be more wise, holier, and better off for it. For obeying God. That was the bottom line issue. This is part of our task is to listen. What's going on here? And what's the real issue? You see, are you with me on that? Does that make sense? And we have to really focus. So... On one hand, I wouldn't go after him on Adam and Eve. I would, though I would say this. You know, geneticists have been pointing out that you have to trace the human race back to an individual man and woman. That it wasn't a group effort. It wasn't a committee. That the origin of Homo sapiens has to trace back to a genetic change in two single individuals. And that's what, that's what geneticists are saying. That's been in the news. Have you not seen that? And that's one of the things you might say, well, Father, what about what they're saying in genetics now? That there had to be one man and one woman. And he wouldn't have, he probably wouldn't have thought of that. So that's some of the stuff that we have to take a look at. But, you know, then you want to get the more basic, what, find out what his more basic issues are and get at those. Okay? And pray for that girl, too. I hope that she, you know, comes back to the faith. 255. All right. Take a break.